All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm excited to welcome you all to this com complimentary webinar on the upcoming changes to the E&M guideline, guidelines for hospitalists in the ER department. My name is Rob Del Giorno, and I'm the chair of the Investigations, Audit, and Compliance Group here at Garfunkel Wild. And I'm joined by Garfunkel Health Advisors, President Alicia Schickel and our associate, Simon Shakler. Back in 2020, we were here getting you ready for the 2021 E&M changes, and we're back at it again, helping everyone get up to speed on the 2023 changes. For those of you familiar with the 2021 changes, you'll see a natural progression here and a continuing focus on your coding levels being driven by medical decision making and an effort to ease documentation burdens, though I'm not sure that will be accomplished, but of course time will tell. Garfunkel and Garfunkel Health Advisors have always been ahead of the curve on changes in the healthcare industry, and in this case, so much so that after we booked this date, CMS came out and issued their EM guidance, and we built that in here. And they seem to be piggybacking us by hosting their own presentation. I believe it's it's even today, so maybe November 8th is the day to talk EM changes. Before I turn this over, I want to let you know that there's more to come from us on the compliance front. We are launching a compliance lunch and learn series to really drive a, you know, a place for compliance officers to come and join in for a half hour lunch and learn. And we're going to be come, kicking off with covering, you know, the new upcoming changes to the New York's compliance program regulations. And we'll follow that up with what your compliance program and reviewing your compliance program requirements, offshore data requirements for those of you who are under managed care agreements. Now, let me turn this over to Alicia Schickel. I could go on and on about Alicia. And for those of you who've already worked with her, and I've seen the list here, um, I know many of you have. She's downright excellent at what she does. She's well-respected in the industry. She's been a fantastic partner for Garfunkel Wild. And she and Simon have really put together a fantastic presentation. I've gone through with these slides. Um, and I love the fact that, it, you know, in some ways there's there's a lot of dense material in there, but that's because the, these slides and this recording is going to be sent to you. It's all going to be posted on the site. So it's going to be a great, re, you know, resource tool for you to come back to. Now, she can tell you about herself. We've got a lot of information here and about Simon and GHA, but, you know, Alicia, why don't you kick this thing off? Yeah, awesome. Thank you. And thank you so much. We're so grateful that so many friends and colleagues are joining us. Uh, for your lunch hour. Again, as Rob said, we have a lot of information to cover. It's action-packed, um, but basically we'll really be giving you a high-level overview of the changes and how we think it's going to impact you the most. Um, so uh, again, I'm Alicia Schickel. <clears throat> I've been in healthcare about 36 plus years. Um, Simon uh, also has a ton of experience in revenue cycle integrity, payment integrity, documentation and coding. Uh, and GHA is turning two. Uh, so we're super excited about that this year. Uh, we are a full service advisory team of uh, industry experts. We have a lot of great people uh, working with us. We uh, have a, a high concentration. We, we focus on revenue cycle integrity, um, but we also have a focused niche area in documentation and coding compliance, and we offer a full suite of uh, audit services. So please, if you want to learn more about that, check out our website. Simon. Great. Okay, a little disclaimer. Uh, we all know that the only constant thing in healthcare is change. So the slides are current as of information available today, um, but please be mindful how frequently things change. So keeping up to date on, uh, on all of those changes is really important towards compliance. Okay, so our goal today is to take you through the latest update to the ENM guidelines um, and review how these changes are going to impact your providers and your staff, right? Because it's not, you know, while the providers are the key uh, to the documentation, the staff uh, are also really going to play a, a key role um, in getting all of this right. <clears throat> so today we're going to change, uh, we're going to cover the medical decision making and the time requirements. Um, and again, we only have an hour, so we're going to give you as much information without having your eyes roll in the back of your head here. Um, so stick around for happy hour and Q&A, and drinks are on Rob. You're up. <laughs> All right, so let's take the pulse here. You know, I see we, we're, we're, we're well over 100 participants. Let's do a little poll. Let's see where people are with these things. I'm going to launch a poll here, and you <laughs> let us know if you can get a little interactive, 
uh, audience play here and see, you know, who's heard of the changes, who didn't know, where are you, who's ready to go. Um, let's give it a chance to get up here. I don't have any great Steve Harvey kind of answers here, but um, <laughs> this is, uh, we're doing great. We got a ton of participation going. We'll leave it um, leave it open for for just a little bit here. We've got over seventy answers already. Nice. Um, all right, last chance. Who's getting in here? I knew there'd be a few more of you. You just couldn't resist. Let's do it. Let's see, are we going to hit 80 and I'll end the poll? Oh, you guys are crushing it. You keep going. All right, let's let's see. Let, let, let's see let's see where we are. Let me share these results. All right. So pretty good, right? So pretty good here, I think, Alicia and Simon. I think it's, it's, uh, it's great to see how many here have heard, at least heard of it, some preparation. And, you know, on the, on the front end, not knowing and those being prepared kind of as expected, kind of on the outer fringes there, 14 and 7%. But, you know, yeah. I, I love the solid, the solid middle ground here and, and, you know, helping you get ready in some preparation or we're taking you to the next level. That's what we're here to do. So I'm going to take this down and let you keep going. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Great. So, so this is great. And thank you so much for that. It really helps us to kind of gauge uh where everyone is and and this is like a great segue into just taking a quick look at the evolution of EM services in general um be up until the 2021 new set of guidelines coming out there had not been any updates to these EM guidelines in over 25 years uh so all of us across the industry were you know calling for this it was so needed to really update um, the leveling and the billing component of it to stay up to date with how even our providers are practicing medicine. So we know under the old guidelines, and I know even though in 2021, when the guidelines came out, they were applicable only to the office and outpatient setting. So a lot of the providers who are now moving into this 2021 model um, have not really been exposed to these changes, right? You're still leveling your services under the old guidelines of the three key components, the history, the exam, the medical decision making. So the good news is all of that is going away. Um, and as we've been training for years and years and years, the key, one of the key components of the medical decision making has always been uh, um, has of the leveling, I'm sorry, has always been medical decision making. So we're really happy to take you through what these updates look like. So these new changes in 2023 are going to impact hospital inpatient and observation care services, inpatient outpatient consultations, emergency department services, nursing facility services, uh, any services that are rendered in the patient's home or their residence, and then there's a bunch of changes regarding prolonged service codes. So overall, um, at the end of the presentation, Simon's going to take us through the technical changes. Um, we're seeing significant updates to the codes. 25 codes have been deleted. 41 uh, codes have been revised. So stay tuned for that later in the presentation. <clears throat> All right. One of the biggest areas that has not changed is medical necessity, right? And the fact it's even more important now uh, than ever for providers to make sure they're getting their documentation right. So complete, thorough, accurate, timely documentation is critical, not only for excellent patient care, but it's gonna be the key to supporting the medical necessity for the services that you're rendering and seeking reimbursement for. Um, we can't stress enough, things that are not considered medically necessary are not reimbursable. Um, so it's really the content and the information that you're providing in the, in the documentation that's going to support you and back you up, um, one, if you ever fall under audit, or worse, under investigation by enforcement agencies. Simon. So all of you who know me, who have ever attended any of my presentations, when we get to the documentation piece, I always get up on my soapbox because um, it really is, everything kind of boils down to the documentation and all the matters that we deal with 
this is one of the key elements for uh, defense and again, to support your medical necessity. So we put together this little grid uh, chart for you of things that really should be, must be in the documentation in the medical record. You should be documenting, is this a new or established patient? Have a chief complaint. Make sure you're documenting relevant history and exam, documenting all of your orders, your uh, assessment, clinical impressions, plans of care, risk factors. Make sure you're documenting timely and you're signing off on your notes. Um, so all of this is a critical component to making sure your documentation is complete and accurate. All right, so we built the presentation on the AMA guidelines. Um, they came out much sooner and CMS had their proposed rule out there. Um, and unexpectedly, uh, they came out with their final rule around November 2nd. So we did update um, the slides to, we're gonna kind of shout out to you where we see some differences. So even though CMS adopted the lion's share of the changes, just be mindful that there still are some slight differences in descriptions or some policies and even some of the codes. So, all right, so this is a great segue um, for me to turn the presentation over to Simon and he's gonna take us through uh, what some of the initial changes here look like. Okay, great. That was a great introduction of how we got to where we are today. So new versus established patients. Uh, we pretty much didn't see any changes in the definitions for a new and established patients from the old guidelines. So just a quick recap of the CPT definitions. Uh, a new patient is one who has not received any services within the last three years from a provider of the same exact specialty and subspecialty, whereas an established patient received some form of service within the last three years from a provider in the exact same specialty and subspecialty and belong to the same group practice. Uh, so one important thing to note for all the emergency department providers out there is that there will be no distinction between new and established patients for you. All patients will be considered as new patients to the emergency department, regardless of how many times you saw the patient prior in the emergency room. Initial versus subsequent service. So this is a new section that was added by AMA for for face to face services that are rendered as hospital inpatient and observation care setting. Uh, note that the following um, guidelines relate to AMA CPT guidelines, and CMS will have slightly modified guidelines due to not recognizing subspecialties, as Alicia mentioned before. Um, initial service is one uh, when a patient has not received any services from a provider of the exact same specialty or subspecialty during the initial hospital or observation stay. Whereas the subsequent visit is a patient who has received some type of service during their admission stay by a provider of the exact same specialty and subspecialty. So a good way to remember this is that did any of the providers in this uh, same group practice see the patient during the patient's stay? Uh, any NPs and PAs that work alongside the doctors will be considered as if they are working in the same exact specialty and subspecialty as the provider. So it is important to note that the code uh, selection category will depend on whether the provider of the exact same specialty and subspecialty has seen the patient during the same admission state. So during the uh, patient's admission, um, inpatient or observation stay, providers may only bill one initial visit and all follow-up encounters will with the patient will be considered as subsequent visits. If the patient is discharged and then readmitted, let's say in a few weeks, then the provider can build the initial service again for the new admission stay. So for example, every time a patient is admitted to the inpatient hospital stay from a two day observation stay due to let's say worsening mental status by the same physician, it is considered as a subsequent inpatient service because 
it is considered as one single state. So that is important to understand that if an observation leads to an inpatient state, it is going to be considered as one continuous state. Yeah, and I think that's an area probably most providers and even coders are going to really want to focus in on to make sure that you are actually selecting the correct uh, sub initial or subsequent code there. So that's going to be important. Um, AMA has also provided clarification for document uh, for guidelines for the data to be reviewed and or analyzed and separately reportable services. This is an area where we see many providers struggling to decide whether or not to count data to be reviewed and analyzed when ordering and reviewing tests. So AMA has stated that if a provider performs any type of professional interpretation of a test, let's say an ECG, and is billing for the service separately, then we, uh, you will not be able to count it towards the medical decision-making process. Meaning that if separate billing of a service is performed, it, it will already encompass the ordering and interpretation, so it will be considered double dipping. On the other hand, tests that do not um, require separate interpretation, such as urine analysis, point of glucose test, strep test, and so on, may be counted as ordered or reviewed when selecting the medical decision-making. And the reason being for this is that it is not considered as separate interpretation because you're pretty much reading it off the machine, uh, the technical result of the test. So for example, uh, let's say a patient presents to the emergency department with um, left-sided abdominal pain. The ED physician uh, examines the patient and makes the decision to perform the bedside ultrasound. Since the bedside ultrasound uh, requires a professional interpretation and report, such as noting any abnormalities or changes, and separate billing will be done for, for the bedside procedure, then the physician cannot count it as a bedside, ultra, uh, um, as a bedside ultrasound order or reviewed. On the other hand, if a radiologist performs the ultrasound and not the ED physician, then the ED physician may count it as test ordered or reviewed because the ED physician is not gonna be performing the separate billing. And Alicia will show us that later down the line. Uh, so again, the intent here is to prevent providers from gaining in the ENDEM level if they are, will be receiving financial gain from the separate interpretation and report. History and physical exams starting for 2023. Uh, we're going to see a major change in the AMA guidelines for history and physical exam. So under the new guidelines, a medically appropriate history and physical exam will be required, and it will no longer be used in the determination of the level of the encounter. So this is not new to, to those who are used to the 2021 guidelines, but it will be new for those of you who did not use the 2021 guidelines. So although history and physical exam will no longer be used in leveling the ENDEM service, it is still an important factor in the determination of medical necessity for all the uh, encounters. It will now be the provider's responsibility to perform a medically appropriate history and or physical exam at the time of the encounter, and the medical record should contain the pertinent um, information for continuity of care. But the extent of the documentation will now depend solely on the treating physician for documentation purposes and not the level. Yeah. So, so yeah. So during the hospital inpatient stay, the provider should capture the patient's pertinent history and perform a relevant uh, physical exam as it will change from day to day. So for example, if the patient presented uh, and was admitted due to an altered mental status, then the physical exam should reflect the patient's mental status on the day of the encounter. Did the mental status improve, worsen, or remain stable at the time of the encounter? Again, documentation will be the only line of defense and it must be relevant to the date of the encounter. 
So how will 2023 EM changes affect your documentation and the correct code selection for the services rendered? So similar to the 2021 EM overhaul for office and other outpatient services, starting January 1st, 2023, providers will now be able to select the level of service either based on the medical decision making or the total time spent on the day of the encounter for hospital inpatient observation and inpatient consultation. The goal of these new guidelines is to reduce the administrative burden of documentation while allowing providers to document what is relevant and important to the day of the encounter. So as an example, if you are a cardiologist, it may not be necessary for you to evaluate the patient's skin and let's say musculoskeletal system if you're uh, treating them for uncontrolled blood pressure. So as a result, documenting an appropriate history and physical for your specialty will ensure that medical necessity is met and that coders, auditors, and third-party insurance carriers will understand the complexity of problems addressed to the extent necessary for determining the level of medical decision-making. So within each category or subcategory, we're gonna see that there are three to five different levels for reporting purposes. They are not consistent for all uh, sections. So again, uh, we'll go over it and it's important to understand which section you're in because for example, <clears throat> inpatient is gonna have three code, different codes, whereas ED is gonna have five different codes. Also, I wanna put out a caution flag for those e ED encounters and providers. Your um, selection will be based only on the medical decision-making and that new and established patient concept will not apply. And we'll break it down shortly in the ED guidelines. And I'm, now I'm gonna switch it over to Alicia to walk us through the medical decision-making component of the new guidelines. Thanks, Alicia, man. before you start, I just wanted to mention, I posted, we see, we've received a couple of questions here or there. We're gonna to try to get to them. If you would kindly put your any questions you have using the Q&A tool down at the bottom. Um, if we can get to them all during it, if we can't, we'll try at the end, we'll do our best for you. So if you just put them there, that would be fantastic. Thank you. And sorry, Alicia, go ahead. Oh, no. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Um, so yeah, so as Simon mentioned, moving out of the old guidelines into the new guidelines, other than the ED providers, um, everyone else is going to have the option to choose. You either want to pick your level based on medical decision making or you're going to pick your level based on time. <clears throat> and when we get down to uh, looking specifically at the codes that are applicable for those services, you're going to see what's the medical decision making level and then what's the time associated with it. So I think as we get through this, um, hopefully it's going to, uh, you know, really resonate for you how simplified this process has become. Um, the medical decision making really, it's, it's the process of establishing the patient's diagnoses, establishing the status of their condition, selecting your management options. And medical decision making is defined by three elements. The good news is, is none of this has changed, right? The three elements remain the same as you're used to under the old guidelines. And they are the number and complexity of problems that you're addressing during the encounter, uh, the amount and or complexity of data to be reviewed and analyzed, and the overall level of risk, right? Risk of complications, morbidity or mortality um, of your management decisions. So we're going to break these down and look at each of these elements. <clears throat> the four levels of medical uh, types of uh, medical decision making remain the same as well. So we still have straightforward, low, moderate, and high. And then it's important to remember that you only need to meet or exceed the elements within any one of these three categories, two out of three has to be met to meet a specific level. So we'll take a look at that. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, I think this is really important. Um, AMA, when they updated, when we came out with the 21, 2021 guidelines, they did a great job of clarifying definitions and terms as to under the old guidelines, there was a lot of um, ambiguity around that, right? So it's important, I think, to define a few terms as we move into these guidelines. 
Um, so a problem, a problem is defined as a disease, condition, illness, injury, a symptom, a complaint, or any other matter that you're addressing at the encounter. Providers may not always be able to come up with a definitive diagnosis, right? So it's absolutely okay to bill for signs and symptoms until you are able to meet, uh, to get to um, a definitive diagnosis. But I think even more importantly, they came out with terms around what is a problem addressed. Um, so if you think about the term me, a lot of us that are moving into more value-based or risk-based models, we've all heard the term me, which really means is a problem being monitored, evaluated, assessed, or treated? And that is going to be the conditions that need to be met to be counting a problem as being addressed. Mm -hmm. Just because a, a patient has a problem, um, if you're not addressing it, monitoring it, evaluating it, assessing it, or treating it, or using it in your level of medical decision-making, then you would not count it as a problem addressed. And I think just echoing off of some of the things that Simon talked about, documenting the status is gonna be really critical for the inpatient and observation services because they considered the problem addressed, the patient's, the problem status on the date of the encounter. So be mindful, the patient's status might be very different today than it was when they were admitted to the hospital. So I think really important to get some clarity around there. <clears throat> We're not going to spend a lot of time on this because, again, we only have an hour and we want to save some time at the end to get to all of your questions. <clears throat> but this is how the number and complexity of problems are kind of put together um, and how they fall into this element, this uh, number and complexity of problems addressed at the encounter. Um, so AMA also did some great, a great job defining what some of these problems are. What, you know, what does this problem mean or that problem mean? So um, one thing they added this year was acute uncomplicated illness or injury requiring hospital inpatient or observation level care. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then they go through to tell you really what's the definition of that. It's a recent or new short-term problem, low risk of morbidity and mortality. Um, no, go ahead, Simon. Thanks. Um, and basically the patient is expected to make a full recovery. Not every definition that's gonna fall within this element of medical decision-making is gonna be applicable for inpatient or observation or emergency uh, services. And we'll, we'll see how that um, maps out. Go ahead, Simon. Okay, so again, just a few more stable chronic illnesses. <clears throat> they did a really good job defining uh, stable and chronic, right? Chronic is uh, a problem that's expected to last either a year or until the death of the patient. And then stable really means if the patient is at their um, at their treatment goals. So anyone who has not uh, meeting their treatment goals would not be, uh, that condition would not be considered to be stable. Uh, next slide. I think you, as you can see here, like the more complex these conditions are, these are going to fall into those higher levels of medical decision making when we get to the table. I think that'll all come together for you. Chronic illness with exacerbation, progression or side effects of treatment, um, undiagnosed new problem or uncertain prognosis. I think this is definitely a heavy hitter for the ED providers. Treat a lot of patients uh, that fall in this category. And then acute illness with systemic symptoms. Um, again, we're gonna provide the information. Uh, I think everybody should get a copy of the guidelines, get a copy of the final rule from CMS, and really dive into this to understand what these complexities mean. Um, it's really the first step in leveling your medical decision-making. So once you understand the types of problems that you're dealing with and what level medical decision-making they're gonna fall into, then it's gonna be much easier to get to the overall level. And then of course, this is high level, right? Medical decision-making, acute or chronic illness, injury that poses a threat to life or bodily function. Um, these patients are in trouble, right? They're, they're in bad shape. <clears throat> okay. The next component or element of the medical decision-making is uh, the amount and or complexity of data to be reviewed and analyzed. And this is uh, this 
element has seen some revision back under the old guidelines we used to give everything a point you count up your little point system well we're not doing that anymore they have broken the data section down into three categories um, and of course, the higher level medical decision making, the more data elements that are going to be required, and we'll we'll see the we'll look at those when we get to the table. I think it makes more sense. Um, but taking you through the three categories in the data section, category one is made up of tests, documents, orders, or independent historian. Um, what does that mean? So um, as as we get into the grid, you'll see. Higher levels require more elements which, within each one of these categories, but documents are really like, hey, are you reviewing any external notes? Are you reviewing tests that need to be analyzed? Um, I think that's an important piece here um, that AMA came out with some good clarity or definition around, and it helps you. I think it echoes also off of what Simon mentioned about, hey, what can you count under the test section and what's not counted uh, towards the medical decision making. So tests that are analyzed are tests that are ordered um, that don't require an independent interpretation. So even though you're not doing the analytic piece, like an example would be a glucose, it's considered analyzed when you are using the information towards your treatment or your diagnosis um, in your medical decision making. So those tests that come back. What does it mean a unique test? So kind of some clarity around that. If the code has like a, a CPT code, like uh, for example, uh, you're gonna order a chemistry. There may be 12 tests in that, but it's one panel. <clears throat> it's represented by one code. That's one unique test. A glucose could be a unique test. Reviewing a document, outside document, could be considered a unique, unique document. So I think that's <clears throat> important for clarity purposes. And then uh, independent historian is really getting the history from anyone other than the patient. Maybe the patient is not able to give you a history. Maybe they're just a poor historian. <clears throat> Maybe you need to supplement that history with from a spouse or a child or even a caregiver, um, and that's completely acceptable. Taking a history from an independent historian does not have to be face-to-face -face in person, um, but you do have to document who, what the history was, who the historian was, and it, you do have to get it from the historian, so not third party. <clears throat> also, translation does not meet the criteria for that. So if someone is translating for the patient, that's not considered an independent historian. Okay, um, the second category, uh, actually, if you go back for a second, <clears throat> the second category is independent interpretation of tests that are performed by another physician uh, or qualified health professional. That's not separately reportable. So I think this is another area. ED docs are going to, you know, be hitting home runs, getting credit for this very easily. Um, because it does not require a full formal interpretation, but if you are actually looking at the films or the tests and you are doing your own independent interpretation, um, you'd need to document that in the medical record. What do you interpret? What was your interpretation, and how is it relevant to your medical decision making? Um, and as long as you are not separately reporting that, then you are able to take credit for that. And then the third category is discussion of management or test interpretation with external physician or other qualified healthcare professional um, or other appropriate source. So, what do we want to say about that? Um, Discussion, also there's some definition clarity around that, means an interactive exchange, um, just exchanging documentation or medical record notes back and forth with another provider doesn't qualify. Um, you may not always be able to make that connection on the same day, so you'll take credit for this when the information or the interaction is actually being analyzed or used towards some level of medical decision making in that encounter, okay? Um, and then another appropriate source may be a non-healthcare professional like an attorney or a parole officer or a teacher. Um, so it does not absolutely have to be a, another healthcare provider, but someone who is involved in the care of the patient. Okay. So that's a lot heavy winded uh, explanation there. But again, you know, it, while this is really simplified, um, a lot of it, there's a lot of complex nuances um, 
within each of the components. I think you can move on, Simon. I talked about independent historian and independent interpretation. <clears throat> this is one area I really want to talk a little bit about is the risk, right? So we've been through, this is the third element in medical decision making. We've been through the first two elements, the number and complexity of problems addressed at the encounter, the number and complexity of data to be reviewed and analyzed. And now this is the last component of medical decision making. So risk from the compliance perspective, we always say, what is risk? It's the likelihood and probability of an event happening. And then the severity and impact if that event were to occur, occur. And they're not always causally related, right? I always love to give the example like, hey, the likelihood and probability of your organization having a HIPAA breach may be low, but the severity and impact if you did have a breach could really be significant. So they don't always align um, in that way. Um, all right, so there are four levels of risk. Um, we These have not changed. They're still minimal, low, moderate, and high. I think... Uh, one of the big things here that I want to, well, I think we can uh, talk a little bit more about the details when we get to the um, to the grid, but if you look minimal risk, there's been some changes to the ED codes, uh, which I think you should just be on alert when Simon gets to those about minimal, minimal risk. <clears throat> Low risk is really over-the-counter medications, physical therapy, occupational therapy, minor procedures with real no risk to the patient. Uh, moderate risk, you're going to see treatment options and considerations, prescription drug medication management, <clears throat> uh, decision regarding minor surgery, when the patient has identified uh, risk factors, decision regarding elective major surgery, when there uh, are no identified risk factors, and then a new one that was added under the 2021 guidelines are diagnosis and treatment um, which are significantly limited by social determinants of health, right? What is that? Does the patient have access to medication, to healthy food, uh, to safe home environment? And then high risk, I think um, there's a few things in here I think really need to be pointed out. Uh, drug therapy re requiring intensive monitoring and toxicity, um, that may be something that's very common in the inpatient setting. There's very specific criteria that has to be met and documented to meet uh, the criteria for this uh, high level risk to the patient. <clears throat> Again, decision for surgeries, different types of surgeries, and then the parenteral uh, controlled substances. Again, some of these are not new, but there's really great clarity defining around what does that actually mean? what has to be in the documentation uh, to support that. So that specifically, you know, controlled substances has to be administered via either, uh, I, you know, IM or uh, infusion. So again, understanding what's required behind this, providers really have to get the documentation right so that the next step in the revenue cycle, your coders and your billers, have enough information to actually, uh, you know, make sure you're capturing all opportunities and then also uh, not putting you at risk. So really important there. All right, Simon, you want to move into, all right, so let's look at the tool. So this is great. This is just kind of sums up uh, all the things that I've been talking about. This is a uh, we've supplemented, this is GHA's uh, version. We just added in the medical decision-making here on the left side. Again, you have to meet two, meet or exceed two of the three uh, components to pick a specific level. Um, and again, the AMA puts out this decision-making guide as a guide, right? It's not uh, set in stone. Um, you can see here under the low-level medical decision-making, and we talked about this, where all of those number and complexity of problems addressed at the encounter are falling in line here. So low-level medical decision-making, you can see one acute and complicated illness or injury requiring hospital, inpatient, or observation-level care. So that fell under low-level medical decision-making. But now, if you look at the middle column here, the data section, <clears throat> data to be reviewed and analyzed, under low level, it says, hey, you've got to meet at least one out of the two categories that are listed here. What is that? They say under category one, any combination of two from the following. So you either have to you know, order a review a lab or maybe you order a review two labs. That meets the criteria. There's 
there's no uh, definitive way of, hey, I have to have two of these or one of those. Any unique component within that category one and you meet the, the criteria. And or in this level, low medical, um, to, you know, getting the history from an independent historian. And then overall level of risk to the patient is going to be uh, low, low risk of morbidity or mortality. <clears throat> All right, moderate. I think for the most part, people are not getting admitted to the hospital for uh, uncomplicated things, right? Pretty much patients are going to be, um, you know, either not doing well or have, you know, uh, acute exacerbations or unstable conditions or new problems, uh, undiagnosed or complicated issues or injuries. So you can see now the levels are starting to build up moderate level medical decision making. And again, under the category, under the data category, um, more data elements are required. It looks a little complex, but if you really take a minute to review it, it is so simple. Moderate level, you really need to just meet one out of the three categories. And under category one, any combination of three. So literally, if you're ordering two or three, you know, three blood tests, an EKG, um, taking a, a history from an independent historian, you've automatically already met the criteria uh, for moderate level under the data section or independent interpretation of tests or having discussion with external providers or uh, other professionals. And then again, just a guide under the moderate level risk, prescription drug medication management. Um, you know, this is, if you just think about practically your progression of patients that you see, clearly moderate level is gonna be very easy to achieve. The goal here is to make sure that your documentation is supporting all of this. Okay, Simon, let's look at a uh, high level. All right, uh, one or more chronic illnesses with severe exacerbation or a chronic illness or injury that poses threat uh, to life or bodily function. Um, there have been some slight updates in the risk section over here in this table, uh, which we have highlighted out and read for you. Again, the data section. Now you have to meet two out of the three categories, any three under category one, as we talked about, and or independent interpretation of tests and or discussion and management uh, with an external physician. So practically very easy make sure the documentation is there to back it up. And then examples under high level medical decision making, really take the time to look at the requirements for the drug therapy, monitoring for toxicity. That doesn't mean that you're monitoring for the therapeutic effect. It means that you're monitoring for toxicity and there's very specific criteria you've got to get in the record. Um, okay, Simon, let's move on. Hopefully this is all coming together uh, on the medical decision making side. Uh, okay, let's talk about time-based code, right? Because you have the option, either or, it doesn't matter. Patient one can be leveled based on time. Patient two, patient two of the day can be leveled based on medical decision-making. Nothing's holding you to either or, uh, but it is one or the other. <clears throat> so some important things to know about time. Time must be documented in the medical record if you're going to be billing your level based on time. Um, only report the total time that you're spending on the date of the encounter. And one of the big new, the new thing uh, for providers who have not been impacted by the 2021 guidelines is that time includes face-to-face -face and non-face-to-face -face activities spent by the physician or the provider um, on that data service, right? So it's important. You cannot include any time spent by your clinical staff, but it doesn't matter if you're on the, on the floor or off the floor, any time that you spend uh, taking, you know, having um, uh, treatment, giving care, providing care for your patient on that date can be counted towards the level. Documentation. Alicia, Alicia on this one, right? Yeah. Like, like, let's be real here for our, for our providers. Like, you can't just jot down, you know, 45 minutes spent with a scant amount of documentation and think you're going to pass an audit, right? Right. So actually, that's one of our bullet points here. Um, the documentation has to accurately reflect the amount of time. And that's a great point, Rob, because we say like, yeah, you can't build your highest level service and have one paragraph because, you know, under audit, that's never going to fly. It's never going to back up the medical necessity uh, for a high level. So 
you know, it's important to also note that the documentation should indicate all the activities performed, but there's no requirement to itemize exactly how you're spending that time. Like, you don't have to say five minutes on history and 10 minutes on exam, um, but everything that you're doing should be documented and it really should reflect the level of care you're providing the patients. Um, again, total time, a statement of your total time, or CMS says, hey, it's okay, you can do a start and stop time. Um, and then just a reminder, uh, not that the ED docs, this really matters to them, because I think they're going to hit home all day long on um, medical decision making here. So, all right. What counts towards your time? Uh, preparing to see the patient, uh, obtaining and reviewing old records, counseling, education for the patient, their family. Uh, ordering medications, referring, uh, you know, communicating with other professionals, any face-to-face -face time. And then again, what doesn't count, uh, no, can't count any travel time, uh, you can't count any time that's performing procedures or services that are going to be separately billable, uh, and no time from your clinical staff can be counted. All right, so this opens the door. I know I feel bad. I'm giving Simon all the technical pieces of this, uh, you know, and some of it I know it's a little daunting, but it's important to make sure that we're giving you the step by step, you know, accurate of, of what's important in all of these things. So I'm going to hand it over to Simon. He's going to take us through the actual code changes, which I think, um, you know, they're pretty significant. So uh, one thing I do just want to add, and I, I'm not sure, I think Simon's going to touch on this, but we had a question about now that the observation codes are getting rolled, crosswalked over to the inpatient codes, um, how are we going to, what's going to happen? How are, how are the payers going to know, was this observation or was this inpatient? And that is really going to be driven by the place of service. So I think Simon's going to touch on that as well. All right, Simon, take it away. Okay, perfect. Uh, so starting with observation care, uh, the existing observation only EM uh, level codes that everyone is used to, which are your 99217, your 99218 through 99220, and your 99224 through 99226 will be deleted as of January 1st, 2023. So there's no need to panic here for those of you that code and use the observation level codes. Uh, for simplification purposes, the revised hospital inpatient code descriptors will now include initial and subsequent inpatient or observation care, inpatient or observation care, same day admission and discharge, and the inpatient or observation care discharge services. So all observation codes should be crosswalked direct, directly to their inpatient hospital counterparts based on either the medical decision making or the total time spent on the day of the encounter. Uh, AMA also stated that uh, patients um, that are designated or admitted at, as observation status, uh, it does not necessarily mean that the patient has to be located in the observation unit. If no such area uh, exists where you practice medicine, then these codes could still be utilized regardless of the patient location, whether it's in the emergency department or a separate room where you have these patients. So that is one clarification there. Um, the services will depend on basically the type of order that is placed in your EMR and the place of service that is built on the claim form as Alicia mentioned. So that's one thing to keep in mind for your observation services, those that utilize them every day at work. Uh, another major change for the observation level is the observation level care discharge codes. Under the old guidelines, uh, the observation level care discharge were not time-based codes. Under the new guidelines, they will be crosswalked directly to the inpatient discharge codes 99238 and 99239 which are time-based codes. So it will now be the provider's responsibility to document the total time to accurately choose the observation discharge code. So prior to 2023, the admission mm -hmm. via an uh, encounter in a setting was incorporated in the ENDEM from, uh, let's say the office or emergency room into the initial hospital 
uh, visit when the treating provider admitted the patient. This was considered as one continuous service and the provider, as we all know, was allowed only one e and service per day. As of 2023, when the pro patient is admitted to the hospital as an inpatient or observation in the course of an encounter from another service, let's say office or emergency room, then the service in the initial location may be coded and built separately with modifier 25. So uh, just to note that modifier 25 is amended to indicate that the encounter was significant and separately identifiable service. However, um, CMS will hang in on some of their uh, policies designed uh, to clarify coding guidelines and rein in on the overutilization, such as the eight to 24 hour rule. So it is always important to uh, refer to individual payers when billing for these services to see if individual payers will allow you to bill for more than one ENDEM service per day. So now CPT codes 99221 through 99223 will be used for initial hospital inpatient or observation care for the evaluation of management of a patient in a hospital inpatient setting and those that are designated as observation status per day. So the inpatient uh, or observation code are, uh, can also be used for partial hospitalization services if they are rendered. So the code selections will now be based on either the medical decision-making or the total time spent on the day of the encounter. So basically in this chart, we break down the CPT codes. Uh, there's also a parenthetical used um, for code categories um, that are over 90 minutes long to use the prolonged services code that will be created uh, by AMA and CMS. So prolonged services code will be added to the highest level, which is in this case, 99233. Um, and note that these codes can only be reported once per day and once per patient because they are the initial encounter. And Simon, uh, just to, I just want to echo in here that prolonged service is going to be calculated after you've met the total time. So if you're billing your yeah. service based on time, and you exceed the 15 minute mark beyond that, that's when these prolonged service codes kick in. So if you're gonna be billing based on medical decision-making, then they're not appropriate. Oh, so uh, one bit of information to note is that if a patient is first admitted into the observation level care and then transitions to hospital inpatient, then the hospital inpatient does not constitute as a new stay. So it will constitute as cont uh, continuity of care, and you will be required to use the subsequent codes, not the initial codes. So that's one thing to keep in mind when dealing with these codes. Uh, here we have the hospital subsequent codes for inpatient and observation care. Similar to the other codes, you will now be able to choose based on either the medical decision-making or the total time. So whether you are billing hospital inpatient or observation care, for example, CPT code 99232 will require a medically appropriate history and physical and a moderate level of medical decision-making or 35 minutes spent on the day of the encounter. So that's pretty simple here. Uh, CPT codes 99234 through 99236 are used to report uh, hospital inpatient and observation care services provided to patients that are admitted and discharged on the same date of service. So AMA states that the date of the admission and discharge must be the same. So it must be the same day. If the dates are different, then it guides us to use the appropriate initial or subsequent uh, level codes for inpatient and observation care, and then the discharge. Uh, when a patient is admitted and discharged on the same day, the medical record should provide multiple documentation to reflect the admission to the facility, any progress notes or orders that the physician does, and then a discharge summary note. If the patient is admitted and discharged and the provider only completes one document, 
then the appropriate initial hospital inpatient or observation code should be used, not these codes. Hey, Simon, I just want to I just want to check up because we're running out of time. Um, I just want to go through and see what slides we have left here that I think this was an important one to hit on. Um, can you just advance through? I just want to see because I want to leave time at the end, at least to get a few questions in. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think this was just, uh, again, just being mindful that these are now time-based, the 99238 and 99239 for observation services. Uh, yeah, so the only change time. will be for observation, not for the inpatient. So keep in mind for the observation codes. Okay. Uh, consultation perfect. codes, just a quick uh, thing. They must be provider initiated, not patient initiated. And we know that for um, many providers, uh, payers do not recognize these codes. So we included them for your reference in the event that your insurance carriers certain ones do allow them. Right, right. Um, these are the inpatient, um, the emergency department. So one thing to note about the emergency room, again, time is not a factor for the emergency room. So you will solely be basing it on the medical decision-making um, process. So the only difference and change we saw is was to the CPT code 99281. And then you can read on later on about the critical care. Uh, so part of the new guideline, CPT code 99281 had a descriptor change. It is now defined as emergency department visit for evaluation and management um, of a patient that does not require the presence of a physician. So those of you who are aware of the uh, 2021 guidelines, it's similar to your office 99211 codes that do not require really the presence of a physician. So this may include the present uh, when a patient presents for suture removals or some type of injection where the provider places the order and does not necessarily have to be present. So here, uh, again, it's based on medical decision-making, straightforward, low, moderate, and high. And finally, moving on to the last section of prolonged services, we had seen quite a bit of deletions here. And for simplification purposes, just a reminder, all prolonged services codes are used in conjunction with the highest uh, time-based codes. The initial time of the unit of 15 minutes should be added once the primary e and M uh, code description surpassed the 15 minute mark. I always, uh, so feel the, like, I always feel like the prolonged service codes are like the orphan child because they're always at the end. Uh, <laughs> so they always kind of get beat up. But I mean, anybody who wants more information on these, I mean, we are rolling out comprehensive training for our clients right now. Um, so it's hard to cram everything into one hour. Uh, we're hopeful um that the information that we have been able to provide has been valuable again the overall goals really of the changes you know decrease the administrative burdens uh decrease the need for audits you know one i just want to quickly say some lessons learned uh from the inception of the 2021 guidelines um i just can't stress enough like please take the time to learn the changes to be confident, to lose the fear. Like we have seen across the entire industry, not just our clients, undercoding. So providers have now moved into this, you know, reduction on the administrative burden. It's so easy to get to those level, higher levels of service. Um, but we're still seeing so many providers who are just really unsure about picking that level and they always err on the side of caution. So while we always say, don't put yourself at risk. Don't overcode. You know, no one is going to be knocking on your door like, hey, here's a check. We owe you money. So you've got to, you know, lose the fear, get your confidence levels up and be 100% sure you're capturing all the revenue that you're entitled to. So um, let's get going. Like it's time, time to get ready for this. It's, it's a great change. All right, Rob, Q and A right. time. So I see some great questions coming in. Great question. So interactive. I mean, I'm, I'm not really surprised because I was privy to the list and I know a lot of the folks who are on there. Um, so I was really, really great. If you have them, keep them coming right now before we get closed out here. But 
So what's what's the story? Are we still required to document this history in physical? The yes. History in your exam, rather. Yes, than absolutely. So you know, while we say we always put it out there, yeah, you're not going to be using your history in exam anymore for your leveling purposes, but it must, it's an integral component of patient care. And it must be there to back up the medical necessity for the levels that you are picking. So, yes. Yeah. I don't know if we, we have a lot, if you'd like folks, um, you can go into the Q&A, you can see those that are answered. Um, we have a few in here, I'm not sure. You know, it's, it's a little tricky sometimes answering the very specific questions. Um, if we if we can't get to them right now, I, I'm gonna ask if you can take a look, Alicia, and if you can post an answer, fantastic. Sure. If not. Yeah, uh, we can, we'll follow up with the ones we'll that follow up to. with you um, on it and be happy to just, just speak with you. Um, um, you're welcome. These nice comments coming in. Um, people have tolerated apparently the way I look on camera, which is shocking. But um, you know, I thought I thought this was a wonderful job. And for those of you, I see the numbers are dropping because everybody, you know, we're know off for lunch. Stuff. Yeah, we're off for lunch. And as much as we love compliance and in, in, in E and M uh, discussions, people do have to get back to work. So there, there's I think uh, a few open questions here. Maybe like three. We'll try to get to those. Uh, to you and I will tell you yes a lot of questions being come coming in which means you liked it you want it and uh you want more of it so yes you will be receiving copies of the uh presentation materials they're going to be sent out to our to our folks who registered they're also going to be on our websites um you can check us out I posted them in the chat our websites the new Garfunkel Wild website is coming it looks amazing it's probably days away from being launched um, an even better picture of me if possible. Um, and so thank you all. And again, we'll leave this just open another another minute if anybody wants to, to jump in here with um, any other questions so we can get back to you. We really, really love helping people with this stuff. So thanks. Yeah, thank you for no, time and fantastic job. Yeah, I was going to say, don't hesitate to reach out to us, you know, questions. Do you want to set up training? I mean, um, we're here, you know, it's our, it's our pleasure uh, to help with this. So all right, thank you, Richard. We need an entire talk in education about the residents and PAs, I bet, okay? Yes. All right, great suggestion. We uh, also uh, had a great question on split shared, which is another area. There's been a lot of back and forth on that. Uh, we're planning on rolling out some additional uh, information on that specifically. And, and Gwen is asking, did you see my questions in the chat? Yes, Gwen. Um, I'm looking through the chat and I'm trying to uh, make sure we have those those covered as as well. Yeah, we will definitely post these. We will we will answer these and get back to you for sure. Um, all right, well, listen, thank you all. Don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you, Richard, for the suggestion. We'll take a look at it. And um, if you need specific help or, you know, more quickly, yeah, feel free to reach out. Thank, thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you. Have an awesome day. Take everyone. care. Bye.